So I think it's time for an update on my progress in my mission for an orgasmic birth, which I have been talking about a little bit throughout. Um, and I did create one video before this, which I'll link to with some of the things that I started. There might be a small amount of overlap, but I don't think that there will be much. So in this video, I'm going to talk about a bunch of the things that I've learned and have experimented with in the past few months and weeks in order to perform prepare myself for this pinnacle moment. Um, I'm currently 35 weeks now, so I do have a few more weeks of prep left, but I figured I would get this out there. And if I give birth before I'm able to create another one, I won't be jaded by any of the things that didn't work. And I could just share it all because whatever I'm trying might work for somebody else, but might not work for me. Now, in case you don't know who I am, my name is Allie and I'm a health coach specializing in pregnancy. I primarily try to give you some health and wellness tips throughout pregnancy and um, if you're when you're going to have a baby. So if you want to follow my story and either get some health tips or just see if I have an orgasmic birth or not, please subscribe to my channel, Paleo Preggers. So let's get to it. These are the things I've been experimenting with when it comes to prepping for my ideal birth. So number one, and I think I, this is something I, I alluded to last time, but reading positive birth stories. I've probably recommended this book before, but I never actually was able to fully read it, and I did finally get through it. I do highly recommend it to everybody, and it's Ina May's Guide to Pregnancy and Childbirth. So the book is organized where the first half of the book is all about different women who have given birth at their birth center. They created this really cool birth center in Tennessee. And, uh, and it's all stories related to that. They are not all, oh my God, this birth was the most amazing thing ever. They're very realistic birth stories. And throughout, she also gives different tips. And then the second half of the book is her sort of breaking down the different tips and strategies that you can utilize, whether you give birth at a hospital or at home or wherever, in order to have the most positive intervention-free birth possible. So that has been really helpful to me. Um, I am also part of a ton of different pregnancy groups, and I do find the home birth ones probably the most interesting, especially since I'm giving a home birth. But I usually try to keep it to when people say positive birth stories rather than like the trigger warnings, uh, just because not everybody is going to benefit from those. Number two is to practice breathing. Breathing by far is one of the most important things that you can learn if primarily you want to have an unmedicated birth. And that's because if you're super tight, which you tend to be if you're fearful or during a contraction, it's it's hard to relax, right? Because you want to tense. That's your natural reaction. But in order for the baby to come out, you need to have the cervix. If it's tight, it's not going to open. So it needs to relax in order to open for baby to flow out. I know they don't usually flow out, but wouldn't that be great? So a few things that I have found to be helpful with practicing breathing are specifically hypnobirthing. So I have taken a hypnobirthing class. They teach you different methods of breathing in order to um, achieve that relaxation. Um, the primary thing is you want to, you know, inhale through the belly rather than the chest and breathe out. So I'm going to link uh, and, and really relax, not tense up, obviously. Um, I'm going to link to a couple different videos that might also just help provide that and they might give some vi visualization as well to be able to think about when you're trying to breathe and relax throughout contractions. One of the things that I've been doing, um, I've talked about this at least in one of my other videos, I got a pelvic wand to sort of help with some of the knots and tenseness that I have in my vagina. And if I, you know, am trying to work out those knots, 
doing that while practicing breathing is really helpful. So you could do the same thing with like a massage that's like really deep tissue or, you know, anything that's sort of uncomfortable. But yoga poses are actually another really great thing. So if you're going to be in like pigeon pose or something like that, something that's very uncomfortable, um, but has tons of benefits to just try to focus on your breath and trying to relax as much as possible throughout the, the tenseness. Another thing that comes with some of the, like the hypnobirthing and hypno babies things are uh, different relaxation soundtracks. So I do every night before I go to bed, I do try to listen to at least one of those in order to just continue to try to work on relaxation right before bed. Because to me, that's the perfect time you can just sort of practice breathing and practice relaxing as you are going to bed and then you fall asleep much easier than if you're thinking about stressful things throughout your day or what's coming up next, etc. So I do find that that is really helpful. Number three is visualization. And if it's for you to create a vision board. So this one can be very individual. It really depends on what resonates for you. But visualizing in general can be really helpful, especially when it comes to pain management, as well as just knowing that your body can do this. One thing that is, I think, good to sort of picture and visualize is your vagina opening up, right? Because it does, it really does open very large. And it's very puritanical, I guess, in our society where nobody really looks at birthing or vaginas because that they're bad, right? But in, if you can visualize your vagina opening up, you will know that it can do that and it has the power to do that. Yoni art is one of those things where if you can find something and uh, different images of pictures with, you know, vaginas opening up to be really big and the baby coming out, that can be really good. Uh, there are tons of different stuff from like way ancient cultures, but it is hard to find that kind of stuff online. But you do want to find regardless, things that resonate with you. And this is also this also comes down to like, if you wanted to create something like a vision board, which I did, I think I finally did for the first time in my life. But it's like a rainbow mandala. And I have different words that to me resonate like surrender and open. But those are things that sort of resonate with me. It doesn't necessarily resonate with everybody. One other thing that I found really helpful in the hypnobirthing classes is they've come up with all of these, I'll call them meditations, but they really are visualizations. Um, and they have scripts that you would record on your own. So they don't even have them recorded for, you know, you to consume or buy. You would need to record them for yourself. To me, at least, that's something that I would need to do. I would need to record it on something and then listen to it. I'm not so good at just in my head trying to visualize it. So if you are, then that's great. But one of the things that resonated the most with me was something that they called, I think it was called the golden glove, but your hand ends up being like this glowing version of something that can deplete the pain going on anywhere. And, um, you know, you can actually feel, you know, at least I can, you know, your hand tingling, and you can move that all around your body to sort of uh, numb the pain a little bit. So that was one that actually just resonated with me in particular. Now, another thing that I've heard when it comes to visualizations, and this is, you know, throughout the contraction, and this isn't necessarily like, try this. It's more people who have had orgasmic births tend to use this as a description and what they were sort of doing and feeling during that. But riding contractions, kind of like you're riding waves, right? Like you're a surfer, you always want to get ahead of that other contraction and sort of stay on top of it. So this one girl who I've seen in a lot of these orgasmic uh, birth videos that I've watched. I feel like she's like the only one who's in all of them. But she, you know, spends a lot of time and she's she's birthing in a pool, right? And her eyes are closed. And, you know, she's just sort of spiraling her hips and moving around. But it looks like she's actually truly enjoying this experience. And the way that she describes it is kind of amazing where, you know, she's just sort of like taking it and getting a 
above it at the same time and going through it, right? So thinking about it in thinking about your contractions as if they are waves, or if you can kind of come up with some sort of other visualization like that, that allows you to sort of be ahead of it before, so it doesn't just go crashing down on you like a wave probably would, um, is another way. And again, I, I haven't experienced that. I got demolished with by by the contractions that I experienced during my last one. So this is this is the primary reason I'm trying to come up with all of these different strategies to sort of get ahead of it so I can have a better birth experience this time. So number four is mantras and affirmations. These just to have some that again resonate with you, I think is pretty important. Um, there are tons of different birth affirmations that you can find. There are very few that I would say resonate very well for me, but there are certain words and ones that do. Like, my body was meant to do this. Um, words like surrender. Uh, in Ina May's book, she talks about this one woman who wasn't sure how her baby was possibly going to come out. And she put this visualization in her head that, you know, when you're you're, this is what it can do. You know, your yoni can open up to be the size of a grapefruit. You're going to get huge. And she didn't know it at the time, but the woman ended up using, I'm going to get huge as this mantra. So once she was actually giving birth to her baby, she was so shocked. She said she had never seen a cervix open that much. Um, but Apparently, and when they were talking about it afterwards, she kept on talking about this mantra, I'm going to get huge. And it her body just listened to what she was telling it to do. So things like that can also be really helpful. So I've started to come up with sort of a list of which ones I think will work for me and which ones resonate with me. So number five is doing things that will increase my sexual energy. Now, I have not mastered this at all. It's something that I still work and strive to achieve. Um, but I have started to read a couple of books. There's one book called Frequency that I bought that is all about, you know, not necessarily sexual energy. It's just about controlling your energy in certain situations and rather just than feeding off of other people's energy, being able to tap into your, I'll call it home frequency, and, you know, just being controlled by yourself rather than others. And I actually found this woman through Laura Berman, who is pretty well known, and she wrote a book called Cosmic Love. I would actually love to read this. I don't think I'm going to get to it before I give birth. If I do, I'm going to be really excited. But, um, I'm hoping to get all of the same kind of stuff through the book Frequency that I got. So this is definitely more of a woo-woo kind of thing. I do truly believe in energy and everybody having different energies. And you can very easily tell if somebody's in a really bad mood based on the energy that they are projecting into the world. Um, so I'm very fascinated by this. I have certainly not mastered it. I have not had enough time or energy, I'll say, uh, to be able to really get into this as much as I would like, although it will be something I'm going to try to focus on in the next few weeks. Other things that I have found that contribute to increasing sexual energy um, are, again, this goes back to breathing. So breathing up your back and then down your front to your yoni. So like do like a four count up your back and a four count down. And sometimes that will help increase energy down there. Qigong is something else that works with energy. So I've watched a couple of videos on that. That's something else that I do want to get a little bit more into um, if, if I'm able to. The last thing in this realm I'll say is belly dancing. I'm not going to lie, I have not really done any belly dancing. Um, I do think learning the moves and the, um, you know, the figure eights and stuff like that and, and generally spiraling of the hips is really good. I've also heard that um, it's really great for strengthening muscles of the pelvic floor and making you feel like super sexy, which, you know, is always a good thing when, especially if you're trying to achieve an orgasmic birth. The primary reason I haven't done this is I'm a little bit worried because I've experienced a lot of 
joint pain and pelvic floor pain um, and imbalances that I don't want to aggravate that. So that's the primary reason I haven't done a lot with that. Um, but I have been trying to do more of things like, you know, on my birth ball, uh, spiraling on the ball and doing things that kind of mimic the same activity but might not be as strenuous. But that is something that I suggest if you don't really have a lot of dysfunction or imbalances going on in your pelvic floor already. Number six is chanting. Now actually the jury is still out on this one. I don't know if it's resonating very much for me, but I'll tell you sort of the progression I've followed and sort of also died down with. Um, in the orgasmic birth class that I took, one of the things that they recommend is chanting hue, right? Chanting hue over and over. And I did experiment with this. And what I felt was actually pretty cool. I almost felt like the vibration down my body, which made me wonder if that kind of chanting is able to help the baby drop a little bit. Now, I don't know much about chanting. I didn't know who to talk to about this, but I do have one colleague of mine who I know does chanting. And I asked her if when she was giving birth to her babies, if, you know, she found chanting helpful. And she actually did. She does something very different than just chanting hue. When I was chanting hue, it was more, um, it was actually almost easier to meditate than if I just sit there and try to meditate and not think about anything, because ultimately you're just chanting this one word over and over again. And I'm able to much easily, much more easily not think about anything. So I did find that somewhat helpful. And that's something that I probably would be a go to of mine. She shared with me one of the ways that she does chanting. And um, you can look it up. She does this thing. Uh, I think it's basically like a group and they call themselves bootability. But they do this very, um, I don't know how to describe the chant because I'm not big into chanting. Um, but it's it's a very quick paced thing. And it's meant to, you're supposed to do it at the beginning and the end of each day. And it's basically meant to, to focus maybe the things that you want in life, and it's supposed to maybe give them back to you. Um, I did try it a number of different times. And it didn't really resonate with me. It honestly maybe because you have to, it's very quick, and you have to breathe very fast. To me, I just want something that's a little bit more relaxing. Um, but for her, when it came to giving birth, it was something else for her to focus on. So this is one thing where it very well may work for you, even if it doesn't work for me. Um, so I stopped really doing that more quick chant. And I will probably go back to maybe um, during different contractions, chanting hue and seeing, you know, what that does, what that feels like, if I feel like it is helping the baby to drop, if it is helping me to relax a little bit. So that's just more of a personal thing. And uh, I wanted to throw it out there for something that I've experimented with. So number seven, and this I think is one of the most important things for you to do, is to make a list of things that your partner can do to help you during labor. Everybody is different. And this I primarily came up with during my hypnobirthing class. And that was because my husband could not join me for the hypnobirthing class. And when I say could not, he didn't really want to anyway. Um, and that was fine. It was a lot of hours. We also have a toddler. So he got to put my son to bed during that time. But um, I started a list because the hypnobirthing does have a lot of things that the partner can do um, for each person. And especially things like the reading of the visualizations and doing stuff like that. Um, but I started to come up with a list of things that I wanted to share with him that he could specifically say for me. So like, the, for example, and, and these are the things that I referenced before. So like the mantras. I could tell him what my mantra is so he can remind me because when you're in like the throes of labor and you're having these contractions and you're just trying to get through them every, you know, minute, 30 seconds, whatever they're, however they're running, it's very easy to forget everything that you have planned for. But if you have somebody, whether it be your partner, a doula, your midwives, telling you the things that you had on your list that you 
that resonated with you, that I think is probably one of the most useful things. When I gave birth, you know, to my son a couple years ago, I had all this stuff. I had affirmations in my bag and I had lights and, and different stuff. And because I kept on waiting, honestly, to go to the birth center, so I didn't bring any of it into the hospital. So um, I, I had all this different stuff, but I didn't break out any of it. And nobody knew all of the things that were in my mind because I just hadn't shared them. So if you can make a list of all the things that your partner can do to help you, then you will most likely be reminded of those things. So for me, and I might honestly make a video about some of these anyway, because a lot of this is more for like natural labor. If you don't want a natural labor, you know, you don't need maybe some of these things. But these are just things that I've learned through all of the different stuff um, that I'm going to add to this list. So one of the most important things that I think everybody should try to do so you continue to progress in labor is to do everything you can to keep your stress low and your cervix open because it is known that your cervix can be open, right? You could be like five centimeters and then all of a sudden something happens and it's like, no. And there's a reason for that. It's like, you know, the whole tiger in the woods thing, you're giving birth and oh my God, now you need to run away. All of a sudden your body needs to protect yourself. So you close up so you can escape from the evil tiger that's going to be there. Um, that's going to attack you. So a lot of the things that will cause your cervix to close very tightly um, are things that just keep you away from focusing and relaxing on what you need to be doing. So lowering the lights is really helpful to put you in a more relaxed state rather than, you know, you've just done a whole bunch of labor at home and now you're at the hospital where all the lights are bright and, and you know, it, it's not a good environment, right? So keeping the lights low having strange men in the room, which they could be doctors, right? Just coming in, poking and prodding and then leaving. That can be actually fairly traumatizing depending on what people are doing. Um, and actually it's it's also uh, been recorded in many, many documents, even from like the 1800s about how like, you know, this doctor walked in and basically all of a sudden labor stopped. Um, just people in general wanting to constantly touch you. So these are all things that you can try to sort of put into your husband, partner, whatever, like that, their mind to say, like, keep these people away from me. Unless it's like absolutely necessary, I just want to kind of do my own thing. Another thing to remind the people that are around and helping you out is to hydrate often and to remind you to pee every hour. So your pelvic muscles relax usually when you sit on the toilet um, and that can also help the baby descend. Other things that can help pick up labor are nipple stimulation, um, touch and massage. So uh, most birth classes are going to cover things like that, but these are things that you can, you know, go over with your partner and, and be like, this is a better way to touch me and massage me than this. I actually really hate when you do that. And that can also have other uh, positive effects if, if all of a sudden your partner is learning how you really like to be touched. Um, another thing that I've learned is supposed to be really great for labor and especially an orgasmic birth is kissing during labor. So that's something that I definitely didn't uh, try before, but kissing and also touching yourself, right? These are things that will allow, first of all, your energy to increase more blood flow to go down into your nether regions. And my, those two things specifically will definitely help you have more of an orgasmic birth. Again, I personally didn't try this during my last birth or my last labor, but I don't know what it's going to be like to make out with somebody during a contraction. It could be really pleasurable. It could be awful, but it's certainly something to try. You want to try everything that you can to possibly improve your experience, you know, whatever works. Um, other things, gratitude and surrender to your body, right? Again, these are words that I personally like, uh, but if you can kind of phrase them in a way to, you know, pose these different like mantras to have your partner or doula or whoever it is to help assist you and remind you what you're doing, that is ultimately the goal. 
And lastly, and I think that this is super helpful just in general, as far as helping you to be able to relax is the state of the relaxation of the mouth and jaw is directly correlated with the ability of the cervix, the vagina, and your anus to open to full capacity. So in knowing this, right, you are less likely to tear if all of this stuff is able to open. And it's much easier to relax your mouth and jaw than it is to relax your pelvic floor. So there are a ton of different ways to try to relax your jaw. Um, But you know, and this also comes down to like vocalization, having people encourage you to make sounds that you don't really want to make. I mean, I was so self-conscious with my first birth and I was like, I I, I don't like how I sound. My husband's like, who cares? Make it anyway. I'm like, I don't feel sexy. But there, there were a bunch of these, um, you know, a bunch of these tips and, and most of these come from Ina May's guide to birth and uh, childbirth, but um, things like singing deep and low, right? Ultimately, you want to have this low vibration that gets down into your chest, um, orgasmic sighs. Mooing like a cow is another one that will actually make you also probably laugh as well, which can also be really good for relaxing your body. Another fun one is horse lips. So like, right, that could also make you laugh Um, or blowing raspberries. Uh, Or I mean, if none of these resonate or you think would be actually fun to do, uh, you could just doing a sigh. (sighs) <sighs> right? You can, if you do that, you can, if, especially if it's like really deep, you can feel that. These all also help with constipation and severe cramps when you have your period, because it's all related to your sphincter and you, these specific sphincter muscles are super tight. But then when you relax your jaw and stuff like that, they're more easily able to open. So it's just something else to keep in mind for, for that kind of thing. So I definitely recommend making a list of all the things that you can tell your partner to do and help you do during labor. Sometimes, even if you wrote them down, you might not want to do them in that moment, but at least having them so so they know more of what resonates you with you than, than not is helpful to have around. And I say this, especially with men. Men like specific directions and to follow rather than, oh, maybe I'd like this, maybe I'd like this, and leaving it up to them. If they have concrete things that you can do for them to help you, I guarantee it will be much more successful if you just give them a generic guideline. So those are all the things that I've been working towards to try to help me achieve this goal. Try them, see if they work for you. Uh, If you've tried any of them or have any, especially tips on increasing your sexual energy or things that I didn't mention, please definitely add them to the comments because I would love to hear what other people are doing or have done in order to achieve an orgasmic birth. If you want to see if I am able to achieve an orgasmic birth or just want weekly health and wellness tips for pregnancy or for newborns, please subscribe to my channel, Paleo Preggers, and hopefully I will see you next time. Bye.